Hello, I'm Dr. Ronald W. Satz, founder and chair of the International Society of Unified Science. This is my paper, Theory of Unit Space Time and Displacements from Unit Space Time, Material and Cosmic Photons, Subatoms, and Atoms. Abstract. The reciprocal system is in competition with quantum mechanics, the standard model of particle physics, and general relativity. Whereas the reciprocal system accepts Planck's quantum of radiation, Einstein's application to the photoelectric effect, and Broglie's wave function for subatomic diffraction, it parts company with quantum mechanics in regards to the probabilistic wave function psi for atoms. The reciprocal system rejects the concepts of the standard model of particle physics, including its 36 quarks and 8 gluons and other, quote, gauge bosons. The reciprocal system also rejects the non-Euclidean geometry of general relativity and similar gravitational theories. This paper provides the concepts and mathematics of the reciprocal system theory of space-time, photons, subatoms, and atoms, both material and cosmic. Space and time are the two reciprocal aspects of space-time and are perfectly symmetrical. Bare space-time represents unit speed c. Photons, subatoms, and atoms are displacements up or down from unit speed. There are thus two major sectors of the universe, the material half, with speeds usually below that of c, and the cosmic half, with speeds usually above that of c. But in the cosmic sector, the motion is in time rather than in space, so the velocity equation is inverted. The cosmic particles are inverse to the material particles, not anti to the material particles. There is no missing antimatter sector of the universe. The cosmic sector is localized in time, not space, and therefore mostly invisible to us, except for the cosmic background radiation and the cosmic rays. The actions of entities depend on their space-time concentrations and their space-time separations. There are no gauge bosons exchanged between particles. <clears throat> Introduction and Literature Review Dewey B. Larson, an engineer scientist, originated the reciprocal system of theory. His many books are listed in references 1 through 8. The present author summarized the reciprocal system in reference 9 and has worked out many of the technical details in numerous papers. See references 10 to 30. This current paper updates some of the earlier work, mostly published in the ISUS journal Reciprocity, listed in references 19 to 30. The reciprocal system is in competition with many of the theories of so-called, quote, modern physics. Numerous books exist touting, quote, modern physics. Reference 31 is useful for its examples in solved problems. An early work, though, still some value is reference 32. Professor Penrose's work, reference 33, is 1,099 pages long the first 400 pages of which are the mathematics and the remaining 699 pages, the physics of practically every contemporary theory, except for the reciprocal system. Professor Bettini's work, Reference 34, provides an up-to-date treatment of, quote, elementary particle physics. To his credit, he does recognize on page 5 that mass is Lorentz invariant, unlike what is stated in practically every other conventional physics book. A couple of earlier works on particle physics references 35 and 36 are still useful for their clarity. Particle physics and astrophysics are intimately related. Reference 37 tackles high energy astrophysics, including cosmic rays. Reference 38 is a simple treatment of astronomy with some solved problems. Professor Lang is known for his numerous books on astronomy and astrophysics. Reference 39 is his latest at an intermediate level, whereas reference 40 is his advanced mathematical treatment. T. 
to his credit, Professor Lang describes the quote Faint Young Paradox, or Faint Young Sun Paradox, reference 39, pages 252 to 253, which shows that the sun has actually moved up the main sequence in accord with the reciprocal system, whereas it should have remained essentially in the same location as when it formed according to conventional theory. Professor Lang also points out that quantum mechanical tunneling, pages 220 to 224, is necessary to explain how the hydrogen ions overcome the Coulombic barrier to fuse in order to generate, allegedly, the sun's energy. This is, of course, a kludge. Reference 41 by Professor Shu is still a standard astrophysics work used in college, although it's been superseded to some extent by reference 42. A couple of early works in astrophysics are still useful, reference 43 and reference 44. Professor Harwood, author of reference 43, now has a fourth edition of his work available, but he asks the same uh, he has essentially the same questions at the end of it in the epilogue, so it seems that nothing much has been achieved in conventional theory over the past few decades. Handbooks and encyclopedias are indispensable to any working theoretical physicist. Reference 45 has many tables of astrophysical data arranged very nicely. Reference 46 is an encyclopedia for astronomy and astrophysics. Reference 47 is a recent physics handbook from Germany, very concise yet very comprehensive and nicely typeset. Reference 48 is an old handbook, but it has a detailed treatment of cosmic rays. Reference 49, a Russian compilation, has been extremely useful to the present author all throughout the work on his current set of theoretical physics papers. It has a very detailed table of all, quote, elementary particles. Reference 50, the CRC handbook, is the standard for American physical scientists. Reference 51 is an online reference to the latest results from the particle accelerators. And reference 52 has a well-organized color insert displaying the basics of the standard model of particle physics. I'm going to glide over the nomenclature here because I'll explain the symbols as we go along. down. The section is the unit conversions and physical con uh, constants. Here we have to convert from natural units to uh, the conventional units that are used. So we have the speed of light c, the, the uh, natural unit of distance in the reciprocal system is 4.558816 times 10 to the minus 6 centimeters. Interregional ratio is 156.44444. You can see the time unit and actual unit there. The <clears throat> solid state and liquid state natural time unit is, or excuse me, temperature unit is 510.8 Kelvin, and so on for the rest of the constants. Uh, when masses are stated in terms of MeV, this should be interpreted as MeV divided by C squared multiplied through by C squared. This is kind of customary to leave off the C squared. Section 1, space-time. A, the natural reference system and the gravitationally bound reference systems for motion. Most physical theories view time as one-dimensional and constituting a kind of quasi-space which joins with the three dimensions of space to form a four-dimensional space-time framework within which physical objects move one-dimensionally. This view has been formulated to help explain some of the new phenomena discovered in the 20th century such as the very small, the very large, and the very fast. These phenomena exist outside of our normal everyday world where Newton's laws predominate and where space seems to be totally separate from time. However, even with this modern framework, most of these phenomena remain mysteries in whole or in part. In contrast, the reciprocal system of theory postulates 
that both space and time have three-dimensional aspects and join together to form one entity, space, time, or motion, which itself is three-dimensional. Space and time are the two reciprocal aspects of motion and have no properties other than what they have in motion. Here, space, time, or motion is theorized to be the sole component of the physical universe, not the framework or the background for particles of matter or, quote, forces. Matter in the theory is itself a form of rotational motion and may move translationally in more than one dimension coincidentally. The Newtonian reference system is based on three dimensions of space and one of time. The space is considered to be stationary and the time is considered to be flowing. Within this space, material objects move as a function of time in one dimension in a specific vectorial direction. The classical physics textbooks hardly ever treat purely scalar motion. This one dimension of motion may be resolved into three components, one along each of the three orthogonal axes of the reference system, usually denoted x, y, z, or x1, x2, x3 in Cartesian coordinates. In the reciprocal system, space and time each have the properties of the other. Time is three-dimensional like space, and space progresses like time. Of course, the gravitationally bound, uh, of course, in the gravitationally bound material environment, space appears to be stationary and three-dimensional, and time appears to be one-dimensional and progressing. And so the Newtonian reference system works for this situation. In a gravitationally bound cosmic or inverse environment where space and time are interchanged, time would appear to be stationary and three-dimensional and space would appear to be one-dimensional and progressing. So in the reciprocal system, two types of gravitationally bound reference systems exist. The first with three dimensions of space and one of time, and the second with three dimensions of time and one of space. The first is applicable to objects which are aggregated in space, as in our ordinary material sector. And the second is applicable to objects which are aggregated in time, as in the cosmic sector. Conventional physical science says that there are, quote, anti-particles and, quote, anti-galaxies, but does not stipulate an anti-reference system. Of course, in the reciprocal system, quote, anti-particles do not exist, just particles and inverse particles. Also, this opposed dark matter is simply ordinary or cosmic matter unilluminated, mostly between galaxies. A common mistake of students of the reciprocal system is to deduce from the above statements that there are the six dimensions of the universe, three of space and three of time. Some students even conclude there are nine dimensions of the universe, three of space, three of time, and three of space-time. This is not correct, however. All that actually exists are three dimensions of motion, not three dimensions of space or time dimensions that, uh, separately. Of course, we're convenient. We can mentally fix one component while allowing the other to move. This has the effect of concentrating on one aspect of each of the components while ignoring the others. But it's important not to forget that space and time do not exist separately. They're bound together in units of motion, which, are, which is the actual physical reality. Outside of our gravitationally bound region, what happens? It is observed in astronomy that distant galaxies are moving away from our galaxy and all others at speeds approaching that of light. The current explanation is that this is a result of a hypothetical Big Bang some 13.7 billion years ago. But even that explanation is not enough. The galaxies are accelerating away from each other instead of slowing down. So now the conventional theorists are postulating some sort of dark energy to account for this in addition to the Big Bang. Of course, this is not the explanation of the reciprocal system. Here, the cause is the space-time progression, which manifests itself when gravitation is attenuated. 
it is an effect brought about by the motion of the natural reference system relative to our conventional stationary spatial reference system. The fundamental equation of motion in the reciprocal system is not some fancy partial differential equation. Rather, it is the simplest possible equation relating space and time to speed or velocity. For the normal low speed motion in the material sector, the equation is, of course, V sub m and the m is for material equals s sub coordinate divided by t sub clock in meters per second just for the conventional SI measurement. This assumes that s sub coordinate is much, the magnitude is much less than the clock magnitude. For the normal low inverse speed motion in the cosmic sector, we have the inverse V sub c equals t sub coordinate divided by s sub clock seconds per meter, or the absolute magnitude of the t sub coordinate is much, much less than s sub clock. Equations 1a and 1b are for gravitationally bound material and cosmic systems, respectively. The natural reference system is not gravitationally bound because it exists prior to matter. So the speed of velocity equation is V sub p equals S sub clock divided by T sub clock and V sub p equals T sub clock divided by S sub clock. This immediately implies that in natural units, V sub p equals 1 and V sub p equals C in conventional units like meters per second. The natural reference system moves at unit speed, which we can identify as the speed of light, C. See reference 11 for the dimensions of physical quantities in the reciprocal system. The one-dimensional clock space of all space-time units generates the three-dimensional coordinate space. And the one-dimensional clock time of all space units generates the three-dimensional coordinate time. Now consider a collection of space-time units moving outward from any point in our gravitationally bound system. The equation in Cartesian coordinates is x sub 1 squared plus x sub 2 squared plus x sub 3 squared equals c squared times t squared. Please note that because the motion is actually scalarly outward only, the imputation of a specific vectorial direction for a particular space-time unit is arbitrary. Similarly, there is an outward motion of the natural reference system relative to a gravitationally bound cosmic system. The equation is, by inspection, t sub 1 squared plus t sub 2 squared plus t sub 3 squared equals x squared over c squared seconds in conventional Again, the assigned cosmic vectorial directions are arbitrary since this is actually a scalar motion outward in all directions. Note that the space-time progression originates everywhere and is omnipresent. There is no, quote, single point of an explosion. There is no big bang, and there is no dark energy. Also note that both equations 3a and 3b are Lorentz invariant. The speed of light is the same relative to any other reference system. Reference 31, page 30. The two major sectors of the universe, the material sector and the cosmic sector, each with their appropriate reference system, are stable. In between these two sectors is an unstable transition zone, which cannot be represented properly by either reference system. This is where multidimensional motions B. Lorentz transformations. Note that equation 1a ignores coordinate time and equation 1b ignores coordinate space. But at a substantial fraction of the speed of light or inverse speed of light, coordinate time and coordinate space cannot be ignored. Physicist H. A. Lorentz empirically derived his transformations in 1892. These were then adopted into Einstein's special theory of relativity in 1905. Of course, they work as well in the reciprocal system, although we do not accept the concept of space contraction in the material sector or time contraction for the cosmic sector. 
The entire correction to the usual velocity equations is due to coordinate time in our sector and coordinate space in the cosmic sector. See reference one, second edition, pages 100 to 104. For the material sector, V sub m equals t to the second power minus t clock to the second power all raised to the one-half power times c sub m divided by t, where t here is the total time. t is greater than t clock, of course. And t coordinate time is equal to t minus t clock. That's the time dilation. And that's for the material sector. For the cosmic sector, c sub c is equal to the inverse of c sub m. So, therefore, v sub c equals the square root of s squared minus s clock squared times c sub c over s, where s is the total space, s being greater than s clock. s coordinate equals s minus s clock, and that's space dilation for the cosmic sector. The maximum one-dimensional speed of material object in the material sector is v sub m max equals c sub m meters per second. And the maximum one-dimensional speed of a cosmic object in the cosmic sector is v sub c max equals c sub c in seconds per meter. However, unlike other theories, the reciprocal system allows motion coincidentally in two or three dimensions. The dimensions are, of course, orthogonal. So multidimensional motion is not vectorial. It is scalar only. The motions in the different dimensions are added together as scalars for some purposes and treated separately for others. In the reciprocal system, mass does not increase with translational motion. It is Lorentz invariant. Mass depends only on the kind and quantity of the rotational spin of the atoms, see below. Therefore, the Lorentz factor, which is the square root of one minus e sub n divided by c sub n squared, should not be grouped with the mass it should be grouped with the force, although the end numerical result doesn't change. For example, where there is a high relative speed of the masses involved, the gravitational equation is F sub g times the square root of 1 minus V sub m over C sub m squared equals m1 times m2 divided by 1 over g times f squared newtons of dimensional units. The Lorentz factor modifies the force rather than dividing the mass. The high velocity kinetic energy equation should be written as k equals mc squared times 1 over the square root of 1 minus v sub m over c sub m squared minus 1, which is mev uh, if m is expressed in mev divided by c squared. Thus, there is no distinction between mass and rest mass in the reciprocal system. Similar equations exist for the cosmic sector. C, multidimensional motion. Motion exists only in discrete units, so the question arises, how can we have fractional units? The reciprocal system starts with one unit of motion, not zero units of motion. This one unit of motion is equal to one unit of energy because of the reciprocal relation between space and time. To achieve effective translational speeds below unity, we simply subtract the appropriate number of energy units from one. The equation of natural units is v sub m equals 1 minus 1 over x sub energy, where x sub energy is the number of one-dimensional energy units with dimension c over s, inverse of velocity. As x sub energy is increased, the speed is increased, and in the limit reaches 1 or c. In the time region, the region inside unit space, the numerical value of the energy term must be squared for reasons given in reference 1, first edition, page 19. So, the equation is actually V sub m equals 1 minus 1 over x of energy squared in natural units. Suppose x of energy has the value n in the time region. Usually for the motion of an atom, the energy is divided between the time region and the time-space region, region outside unit space with opposite vectorial directions. Let m be the time-space region quantity, then V sub m equals 1 over n squared minus 1 over m squared in natural units. This is, of course, the basic spectroscopy equation in terms of speed rather than frequency. It does not represent the orbitals of any alleged electrons circling 
an alleged nucleus. Clearly, space-time is not a continuum. It is discrete. See reference 14 for a thorough treatment of spectroscopy in the reciprocal system. Because of the ability of adding or subtracting energy units to the three basic speed ranges, three dimensions of motion, we can have speeds of 1 minus 1 over x of energy, 2 minus 1 over x of energy, and 3 minus 1 over x of energy. Larson denotes the speed range 1 minus 1 over x of energy low speed. The speed range 2 minus 1 over x of energy is intermediate speed, and the speed range 3 minus x of energy ultra high speed. Because of the one-dimensional nature of energy, it is not possible to go from one speed range to the next by simply adding more energy. The only way to accomplish this is by direct addition of units of speed. And the only way that can be accomplished is by huge stellar or galactic explosions. Radiation from matter moving at intermediate and ultra-high speeds will be discussed in the radiation section of this paper. By inspection, one can see that the corresponding motions in the cosmic sector can be expressed as follow. follows. V sub c equals 1 minus 1 over x sub speed. V sub c equals 1 minus 1 over x sub speed squared. V sub c equals 1 minus n sub c squared minus 1 over m sub c squared at all in natural units. Speed ranges 1 minus 1 over x sub speed, 2 minus 1 over x sub speed, and 3 minus 1 over x sub speed. If the motion of matter in our sector in dimension 1 exceeds c, the velocity equation inverts. And so the motion is in time rather than in space because of the one-dimensional speed limit of c, although the object as a whole remains in the same time-space macroscopic location. A motion outward in time is equivalent to a motion inward in space, and so the object contracts. Its atoms move closer together in space in our ordinary spatial reference system. We can identify such astronomical objects as white dwarfs, pulsars, quasars, and galactic cores as objects with motion in the second dimension, and therefore in time. If the motion extends to the third dimension, then the entire object moves translationally in space. This is the situation with pulsars and quasars. Pulsars are white dwarfs with translational motion away from the supernova explosion site in the third dimension of motion. Please note that there is no, quote, collapse of the atomic structure here. The size of the atom in the reciprocal system is the same as that of the, quote, nucleus in conventional theory. Pulsars are not neutron stars. They have essentially the same atoms as any white dwarf. Same thing for the quasars and galactic cores. There's no degenerate matter, and there are no singularities or black holes. Likewise for the cosmic sector, if the motion of C matter in dimension 1 exceeds C sub C, the velocity equation inverts, and so the motion is in space rather than in time, because of the one-dimensional speed limit of C sub C, although the object as a whole remains in the same space-time cosmic macroscopic location. A motion outward in space is equivalent to a motion inward in time, so the object contracts, in quotes, and C atoms move closer together in time, in the ordinary C temporal reference system. We can identify such astronomical objects as C white dwarfs, C pulsars, C quasars, and C galactic cores as objects with motion in the second dimension, therefore in space. If motion extends to the third dimension, then the entire object moves translationally in time. This is the situation with C pulsars and C quasars. C pulsars are C white dwarfs with translational motion in time away from the C supernovae explosion site. There is no cosmic degenerate matter, and there are no cosmic singularities or cosmic black holes. That concludes part one of this paper. Continue with part two.